In this video, I'm going to explain the exact differences between Apple's M1 Pro and Max and M2, because we've got a slew, a slew of new Macs heading our way this year, starting as soon as next month. And M2 just has to be better than M1, right? Well, no, wrong, kinda. Hit that subscribe button and bell and help us build the best community in tech. And then let's dive just super nerdy deep. Come this very holiday season, we may well have an M1 iMac, M1 Pro and Max iMac, and M2 iMac to choose from. Same with the Mac Mini and MacBook Pro. Entry level, powerhouse, and premium. And that might just seem all shades of confusing and maybe just convoluted as hell. The Mac is transitioning to our own Apple Silicon. We're designing a family of SOCs specifically for the Mac. And that M1 family actually began with the A14 Bionic, the chipset in the iPhone 12, with two Firestorm Performance, or P cores, at up to three gigahertz, four Ice Storm Efficiency, or E cores, at up to 1.8 gigahertz, and four G13 Graphics cores, or GPU. Also, 16 Neural Engine cores, or ANE, H.264 and 265 encode decode engines, and up to six gigabytes of unified memory at 42 gigabytes per second. And that all translated to core scores of up to 1583 single and 4210 multi on the geeky benches. M1 is the first system on chip or SOC for the Mac. One of the ways that you can scale a chipset architecture is by escalating the number of cores. That's what Intel has done for years with Core i5 versus Core i7 versus Core i9. Apple as well with A12, A12X, and A12Z. Same generation of cores, just more and more of them. With A14, instead of making A14X, Apple chose to make M1 instead. M1 has four Firestorm P cores at up to 3.2 gigahertz, four iStorm E cores at up to two gigahertz, up to eight G13 graphics cores, up to 16 gigabytes of unified memory at 70 gigabytes per second, and two each USB and Thunderbolt controllers. In other words, the exact same cores as A14, just two more performance and up to four more graphics tuned a little faster to take advantage of the bigger enclosures, resulting in up to 1718 single core and 7426 multi-core on the marks. But when you normalize for things like frequency and thermal envelope, including active cooling systems and the ability to run faster, hotter, longer inside machines that are just bigger than a phone, you get approximately the same single core performance, but way, way more multi-core performance because just way more cores. Yet, we wanted to push the performance of Apple Silicon even further. Enter M1 Pro and Max, still built on the same A14 Bionic Generation Silicon IP, but with only two E cores at the same two gigahertz because the focus was just less on low power tasks like checking email and more on high power tasks like compiling code, which is why they offer up to eight P cores as well also at the same up to 3.2 gigahertz, but in dual clusters. And I'll link up my deep dive below the like button if you're at all curious about all of that. Also up to 32 GPU cores, up to two ProRes media engines, all fed by up to 64 gigabytes of unified memory, up to 400 gigabits per second bandwidth, and three USB and three Thunderbolt controllers. In other words, the exact same cores as M1, but up to four more P cores, 28 more GPU cores, those ProRes engines, and just ungodly amounts of RAM. And that works out to up to 1747 on single core, but 12239 on multi-core. You still get pretty much the same single core performance, but now just way, way more massively multi-core performance because way, way more massively multi-cores. And single core perf ain't nothing. Not when you're counting dock bounces for an app launch, or enjoying that instant iPad-like responsiveness on the Mac. But these days, almost all workloads, especially pro workloads, are almost all multi-core aware. So getting all those multiple cores really, really pays off. But of course, as each core improves, so does the sum total of all of those multiple cores. This is by far the most advanced chip we've ever made. Which brings us to the other way you can scale a chipset architecture. And that's by improving the next generation of cores. That's what Intel has done for years as well. Originally with their famous TikTok cycle, more recently with their infamous TikTok optimize, optimize, optimize cycle, but like Ice Lake, Tiger Lake, and Alder Lake, and also Apple as well, most recently with A13, A14, and A15 Bionic. Now, some years that involves a process shrink, 
like going from seven to five nanometers. The reduction in transistor size enables us to add features and increase performance, all while improving energy efficiency. Other years though, there are architectural improvements like twice the system cache, which improves speed and efficiency by just reducing the callouts to slower, hungrier main memory. A14 was the former, A15 the latter. And if we see M2 just any time before the end of 2022, the iPhone 13's A15 Bionic is almost certainly what it'll be based on. And A15 has two Avalanche P cores at up to 3.2 gigahertz, four Blizzard E cores at up to two gigahertz, and up to five G14 GPU cores, 16 next generation A and E cores, ProRes included alongside H.264 and 265 in those media engines, and six gigabytes across the line of unified memory at 42 gigabits per second. And that brings it up to 1690 for single core and 4645 for multi-core, but also to just exactly where you start to hit into the limitations of benchmark LARP, because it's increasingly hard to see what's hitting an E-core versus a P-core or a media engine versus a GPU. And that's particularly important for A15, where the E-cores got way more performance, the P-cores got way more efficient, the GPU cores just got outrageous, and those media engines didn't necessarily take work off the CPU like they did on the Mac, but enabled work that wasn't even possible on a phone before. So faster, cooler, and yeah, just plain cooler. And I'll link that deep dive below the like button for more as well. So if we choose to live dangerously and assume past behavior is still the best indicator of future behavior, meaning Apple continues to do with M2 what they did with M1 and with A12X before it, what we should be seeing is something pretty close to four Avalanche P cores, maybe at up to 3.4 gigahertz, four Blizzard E cores, maybe at up to 2.2 gigahertz, and up to 10, count them 10 G14 GPU cores. That ProRes engine, extra system cache, but probably still up to 16 gigabytes of memory at 70 gigabits per second bandwidth, and just two USB and two Thunderbolt controllers. Compared to M1 Pro and M1 Max, that would mean better single core performance. The same way A15 has better single core performance than A14, but it still would not be at all competitive on multi-core, not even close, because it simply doesn't have enough of those multiple cores to be competitive. Probably not that third USB and third Thunderbolt controller either, which means probably not as many ports. Where it should win though is battery life, like iPhone 12 to iPhone 13 win on battery life, which is huge if everything else remains equal. But if we don't see M2 anytime before the end of 2022 or the beginning of 2023, then it's possible it won't be based on the A15 at all, but on the next generation A16 coming with the iPhone 14. And unlike A15, A16 is expected to benefit from a process shrink, going from five all the way down to four or three nanometers. And those are marketing names, not absolute measurements, but it does mean even more efficiency and performance, depending on how exactly Apple chooses to spend, save, and just feature set that new transistor budget and everything that it could possibly enable. But still nothing close to the massively multi-core performance of an M1 Pro or M1 Max, because still nowhere nearly that massive amounts of multi-cores. And so come the holiday season and having the choice between M1, M1 Pro, M1 Max, and maybe even M2, here's how it'll all break down. M1 will not only be the ultra low power option, but the ultra affordable entry level holding the line on upfront pricing option. So if you just can't or won't spend dime one more than you absolutely have to on a new Mac, M1 will still be your best friend. And then M1 Pro and Macs will remain the top of Mac mountain when it comes to total performance potential, especially if reports of dual and quad die M1 Max variants for the new iMac Pro or Mac Pro proved to be at all accurate. Expensive, yes, maybe hideously, but meant for those who value time even more than money. And nothing will come close to them until there's an M2 Pro and Max or M3 Pro and Max, depending on when and how Apple chooses to update that ultra high performance silicon. So if you really need Pro or Max level performance, you're still gonna want and need M1 Pro or M1 Max. And that leaves M2 as the new ultra premium option, more powerful than M1, but also way more efficient than pretty much anything. So Apple can just slap it into the hot new, ultra sleek, ultra sexy, next generation Mac designs at a slightly higher price, at least at launch. So if you're not only willing, but happy to pay a slight premium 
for maximum style meets minimum profile, you're gonna to wanna to wait on M2 because that's how scalable system architecture works. And to hear Apple say just all of that out loud, check out my interview with their VP of Silicon and VP of Mac product marketing. You can watch it ad-free, sponsor-free, and the extended version on Nebula, but also exclusive videos like my brand new studio tour series where I'm going through everything I use to make these videos. Cameras is already up and mic and sound treatment is going live this week, probably by the time you're watching this video, and I'll be doing lighting, editing and color grading, what's on my iPhone and Mac, basically everything everybody always asks for, but just wouldn't work at all on this channel given how YouTube works, but exactly how Nebula is designed to work, where I have the absolute luxury of making videos that don't have to be optimized for YouTube at all, but where I just know the nerdiest, most hardcore of you will totally love them, all ad-free, sponsor-free on Nebula, and bundled in for free when you sign up with today's sponsor at curiositystream.com slash Richie, or click the link below. And right now, today, because you're watching this video, you can get CuriosityStream on sale for 26% off, less than 15 bucks a year, less than the price of a USB-C dongle for the whole entire year. And that includes their thousands of amazing documentaries and series like Inside the Mind of a Con Artist, which unearths the human truths behind some of the most extraordinary cases in con artistry. It's the best way to support educational creators directly and the best damn deal in streaming today. For over 26% off CuriosityStream, less than $15 a year, and Nebula bundled in for free. Just click the button on the screen or go to curiositystream.com slash Richie. Clicking on that button really helps out the channel, and so does hitting up this playlist for more, way more on all the new Macs Apple is coming our way this year. So just hit up that playlist, and I'll see you in the next video.